Jeff, would you say the word test three times? Well, remember, there's a six bit. Test, test, test. Perfect. Thank you. That's a good volume. It's not too distracting, but, but, they're, they're, but they're, they're audible, so just letting you know. Not, not just, not just yet. I'll, I'll let you know as soon as we are. People are still coming into the room. Um, and Tom is going to introduce us. Will you move the reverse the slides back to the Okay, I will. I Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Tom, the, the session host. This is session six, technology six, uh, on views. Um, we've got three speakers. Our first speaker is currently in India, um, and uh, he's Jeff Paul. He'll be talking about visualizing edits, and 
Jonathan here will be chairing from from um, from this side. Um, second talk is on testing internationalised applications for Wikimedia content, um, and that will be presented by Kurtik and Runa. And the third talk is on fast CCI taming the Commons category tree, and that will be Daniel Schwinn. Schwinn, sorry. <laughs> okay, so over to Jeff and Jonathan. All right, Jeff. Uh, I'm switching over to the slides now, so your face will no longer be on the big screen. Um, and as soon as I say go, uh, you can go. All right, it's all yours. Hey, um, hi. <clears throat> my name is Jeff, and we're going to be talking about some work I did and some existing work that's already been done on visualizing, edit, and content in Wikipedia. Um, I can't see any of you, so if you guys are swearing at me or throwing eggs, um, I wouldn't be reacting. <laughs> so, so, so anyways, um, uh, a bit about myself, I'm a web developer based out of Bangalore. You can see some of my code I've written on GitHub. And replay edits was was a project I did a year back. Uh, I was part of the first round of the IEG, and I I wanted to visualize the edit, so I wanted to know uh, how articles change over over time. Um, some people come and make small copy edits. Others come and add a lot of content. So it's a very so I I was always fascinated by how articles grew over time. So. So I wanted to create a tool which would let you do that, let you see how an article changed. And then I saw the IEG grant, and then that's how uh, the project happened. So, so, the, so the first question is why visualize something when you can look at a lot of rows with data or, or look at a lot of experts sheet text, why, why bother visualizing, why go through all this pain? So I'd like to show you a classic example of info visualization. Um, so right now you guys are seeing, uh, what you're seeing is one of the most famous examples of classic info visualization. What you're seeing is uh, an info visualization that shows the, shows Napoleon's army invading uh, Russia, the disastrous invasion. Uh, so, so what you're seeing is actually the path taken by the army. But what is also sh the width of the path is actually the strength of the army. So the orange color is the army progressing. You can see the width reducing, meaning people, the soldiers kept dying and dying, and the dark black line is the strength when the army returned back to France. You can see that it is just a fraction of the size of the army that went in. What's interesting about this visualization is it shows you the path the army took, it shows you the size of the army at various points. So if you look closely, you can see that at certain river crossings, the size of the army halves. And it also shows you the, the temperature across the period of the invasion. So this 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 image, this single image conveys a lot of interesting info, which you would otherwise have to read a lot of text or look at a lot of tables to understand. So, but all that data gets conveyed very intuitively with a single image, which I think is the beauty of data visualizations uh, or info visualizations. And, and and these days, we no longer have static uh, visualization. We have very interactive visualization where you can change a lot of things. Uh, so this is just to give you a historical perspective of what data visualization is and why, why it's so interesting and why it's so useful. Because it conveys the story and much more. You can actually understand a lot out of an info, a, a good, a well done info visualization. So what have I done? So my 
the project replay edits uh, showed the date, showed the edits changing like a movie. So if somebody added a word, you'd see the word appearing, and then if somebody added something else, you'd see that appearing. So, uh, so it, it, it's the, the tool lets you see the article changing like a video. You can pause and play, and you can go back. Etc. Uh, Etc. Et I'll, I'll show you some screenshots from the tool. Uh, so, so the link to the tool is on my slides. Uh, on my slide, you can go to the link and play around with it. So th this is how the first page looks like. You can there's you can type in the name of the article. It'll show you a drop down, and and once you select an article, it'll, it'll it, it shows you this page. Uh, so on the bottom of the page, you have a small graph, which is basically uh, every bar in the graph is proportional to the size of each edit, and it's in a sequential order. So, so if you see a long bar, that means uh, a lot of change happened in that particular edit. So in this screenshot, you can see that somebody added. Uh, some the article Barbican Center where the event is happening. So somebody says the theater venue uh, it's so big that an elephant can't move. Obviously somebody was having fun. Uh, but but you can see that almost instantly it got reverted by somebody else. Uh, you guys should go to this article and play around with it on my tool. Uh, also, uh, on top of the small graph, you can see a bigger graph, uh, which has a peg on it. So you can move the peg to the article you're interested in, and then click, click, and then start animating from that position. Another thing about the enlarged graph is that the distance between each edit is proportional to the time between each edit. So uh, unlike other graphs in Wikipedia, the edits done Sometimes the gap between an edit is a week, sometimes it's a year. So the enlarged graph tries to give you a sense of the time between each edit. It visually tries to convey uh, the gap between edits. Uh, so I'm not sure if you guys have heard of Metal Umlo. Uh, so I guess in 2005, somebody made a similar video which showed how the article changed in its initial days. So th this is a video I made with one of the first versions of the tool. So I'm going to play it for you guys. This is this is an earlier version of the tool. Uh, <coughs> so people keep changing content. Some some gets removed, some gets added. So multiple people come add their content. Sorry, Jeff. I just started the uh, I, I just started the video. My bad. It's playing now. Let me know when the video is done. Yes. It's, uh, it's uh, for all intents and purposes done now, so I'm stopping the video. Okay, okay so, so basically this is, uh, so this is how the article changed. Um, so this is just to give you an idea of, uh, a short idea of what the tool does and what, what, what you see using it. Um, another interesting aspect is this, the graphs which let you select the edits that you want to that you want to see change. Uh, also show you patterns of different kinds of uh, vandalism and different people editing. So uh, one of the articles that I found interesting was George W. Bush. Uh, there are a ton of edits on George W. Bush and 
quite often you see somebody comes and deletes the entire article and somebody puts it back. <laughs> so so what, what you're seeing here is basically a lot of deletion of the article and somebody reverts it back. Deletion of the article, somebody reverts it back. So you, you can visually see that there's, there's, a, there's a ton of vandalism happening here. I mean, uh, nobody would really come and delete an entire article all of a sudden. So, so, so the graphs, when, when you look at the graphs, you, you easily kind of get an idea of the activity that's happening to an article. So this is obviously a high activity article and this is just a month uh, in 2007. Um, and I think, uh, I think George W. Bush had a lot of edits, uh, more than a lakh, I guess, more than a hundred thousand edits. So, so I, I, I found it really interesting. Uh, the, the other interesting aspect is, uh, so basically when you go put the peg on top of a edit, uh, the edits by the same author are also highlighted. So here you can see that many of the, so I've, I've highlighted an edit by Cluebot and you can see that a lot of edits that were reverted were reverted by Cluebot. So Cluebot, um, Cluebot, I think, is the stand is one of the is st is still the state of the art in uh, aut automated patrolling. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm right. You guys should correct me. But that that actually brings me to a in interesting question I've had, and I guess uh, lots of people have done research on this. But even then, I guess it's a very important question. Uh, so do bots do a lot of rewards and are they indispensable? Uh, so so one so uh, two researchers from the foundation, Jonathan and his friend uh, Aaron, I think they work on uh, one of their findings was that uh, the number of rivers it's by the bots increase in 2007 and that led to a decrease in the number of new editors coming in because the bots would invariably uh, revert a few correct edits too. Uh, so I guess there's a lot of um, it's a interesting uh, branch, there, there's a lot to understand how what role bots play. And, and another, uh, another interesting uh, another interesting uh, observation I've made from looking at the graphs is that uh, the mean time for a bad edit to get reverted or an act of vandalism to get reverted is not really, it doesn't take a lot of time, especially if you have an entire article deleted or a major portion of the article deleted, it comes back pretty soon. Uh, so again, that's another uh, interesting area of research. Uh, so the next next uh, important factor, important metric that can be visualized is the usefulness or uh, longevity of edits. Somebody could come and make a lot of edits and if most of that is being reverted, then that's not really a good edit. So back in 2000, 2002-2003, Two researchers at IBM came out with this, uh, which is called the flow graph, and this is like been the de facto standard uh, in visualizing the content of edits. So basically, each line, uh, the each line uh, is so, so every every edit that gets added uh, is a line in this graph and the width is the size of the edit. So you can see that in some of the edits, uh, though a lot of content was added. So, but this is a static image and flow circle is uh, an improvisation on the, on the same idea what they've done is uh, it's a very dynamic tool where you can select the time frame and accordingly 
uh, it will change. It will show you the, uh, it, it's the same concept as a history flow graph, but uh, it's more dynamic, it shows you a lot more. Uh, so, th so, so these are the two main, two main visualizations uh, that I've seen, that I've come across, which show you the uh, longevity of edits or the quality of edits. Um, so another interesting uh, work that's come out is this paper called Wiki Credit by a few researchers, and Aaron is giving a talk on that uh, tomorrow. Uh, so, so every edit is passed through an algorithm which gives it a weightage, and then it figures out how long it stayed, and it done it, it does a bunch of calculations. Uh, so I think the end goal of it is. Uh, you can actually say I made a edit to this article and it stayed on for this long and it, it has this much value or something like that. I, I think this is again, this is not visualization, but visualization, uh, the, the previous slides that I showed complement this work. Uh, the other aspect of visualizing an article is evolution of the article. That's what that's what my address, my tool uh, shows the show the evolution of an article, how it changes over time. Uh, so I I forgot to mention you can actually select a set of edits that you want to look at, and then visualize those alone using uh, the tool. Uh, so again, looking at the slide, so so this is the slider and the graph. So looking at this, uh, some other questions I've had is, um, what exactly uh, do editors do? I mean, do they come, do they constantly keep editing an article or do they just come and make a few edits, useful edits and then they just go away? So, uh, so what I've noticed in many an article looking at the graph is that they, they come, they make a bunch of edits, and they go away. It's probably because they've added the content that they are very sure of, something like that. Uh, that's that's an area uh, that I want to further explore, and uh, one metric that I want to plot is the number of articles a person, an editor works on, versus the number of edits he makes on it. So. Uh, so I haven't done it yet. Uh, this is something I want to work on to understand. Basically, what I want to understand is do people really come and make a lot of edits on a lot of articles, or do they just add content which they are really sure of and then they just leave? So another related question I've had is do active editors, do they keep moving from article to article, or do they own an article and keep making edits to it? Uh, so, so those are some questions. Uh, uh, okay, so the edit graph. Yeah, so the edit graph and the slider. Um, so uh, the replay edit tool, which visualizes the edits, shows it like a movie, and the slider, which lets you select all this, are basic are. I've built it as two separate pieces. So you can basically take this slider and put it in your project. If you want to give your if you want to give your users a a way to select edits visually, to look at to look for interesting edit patterns and select them visually, you can use this slider. It's a separate library. You can uh, I put it on GitHub too. So you can go pick up this uh, a few files, uh, the JS file, CSS file, put it in your project and uh, you can let your user select a, a set of edits and then uh, go go about whatever your project is doing. So, so all I want to say is this is a piece that you can reuse in your uh, in your project without you have, having to build this. Uh, so please do use it and if you if you guys are working on projects which can make you so that I'd be happy to 
help you guys uh, integrate this piece into that. Uh, so about my project, I'd love to hear ideas on improving the tool and improving the UI UX. Uh, so, so I've listed the code and also the top page so you can put up your feature requests if you have any interesting uh, features that you want to see on it. Uh, so while building the tool and exploring visualizations otherwise, uh, I've come across a lot of interesting lists of visualization, especially with pretty related visualization. So these are uh, some of the best uh, collection of uh, collect, collection of links or lists that I've come across. The first one is uh, by the makers of Hatmode. Uh, and then the second one is by Eric, Eric Sakte, who, who works for the foundation. And then the third one is by this user called Atlasova, he's very active on the German Wikipedia. Uh, so these are some of the best visualizations of Wikipedia and Wikipedia content I've seen. Uh, so you guys should definitely explore it if you are interested in visualization. Uh, so please do get in touch with me. Uh, clone my code, fork it, uh, reuse it, and you can sh you can shoot me a mail or you can send me a message on my talk page. Uh, thank you all for sitting through <laughs> my talk very patiently. <laughs> so. So I guess we have like five minutes left or four minutes left. You guys can ask me your questions or you can uh, put it up on the Etherpad link. You are on the big screen again, Jeff. Tom, do we have time for any questions? Yeah, we'll uh, a couple of questions. Okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat the question so that make sure Jeff. Okay. Uh, hi, Jeff. One question that I have, your timeline seems to go from right to left and not from left to right. Is there a reason for that? So Jeff, the question was, uh, your timelines. Uh, yeah, yeah, I heard the question. I heard the question. Uh, so that's a vestige of one of my uh, the the way the project evolved. That really doesn't make sense to the user, and I should fix that. I just haven't got to fix it. More questions? Hi, hey Jeff. Does your tool work of an um, offline database dump or from a live database? Did you hear that question, Jeff? No, could you repeat that? Uh, so the audience member was asking if your tool also worked on an offline uh, database dump or if it just worked on live. So, uh, so right now, in the edit, it's from the API that uh, media wiki provides so it so so you have to be online but if if you have a if you have media wiki and the database set up on your local machine or something like that i guess it'd be really easy to change the code to fetch edits from there okay one more question or are we done one more. okay one last question uh, maybe i missed the moment could we see the slider slide or? Uh, yeah. Question from the audience member is, uh, could could they see uh, another quick demo of the slider slide? Do you want me to go back to that Moonlob video? No, I can actually uh, I can actually show you the tool that I, I can show you a demo of the tool itself. Okay. How should we? I don't know that we necessarily have time to do that right now. Um, should I just throw up? Uh, uh, Link to the project again so that uh, the audience members can log in and play it. Yeah, you can. Yeah, I will give you the link to the actual game of the themselves. I'm, I've switched back to the to your slides, so if you can page back to uh, where the link to the uh, tool is, uh, we can display that for a moment. Okay. Uh, Okay. Uh, uh, 
mean, I'm sorry, I can't find it. I've, uh, so the tool is, but the tool I, is I, linked from your IEG page, correct? Yeah, I've I've pinned you the link in the Hangout so you could open it. Uh, we are, we're could open of, it. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Okay. Yeah, you can find it in my presentation. I'm really sorry. I'm panicking and no, I can't no, find no, it. No, no, excellent presentation, Jeff. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So that was uh, Jonathan and Jeff Paul in Bangalore um, on uh, replaying edits. And now we have Kurtik and Runa uh, talking about testing internationalized applications for Wikimedia content. Okay, so uh, Runa and Kurtik. Hi, are we audible? Okay, thank you. So, hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Runa, this is Kartik. We work in the Wikimedia Foundation's language engineering team. And uh, uh, I, I'm the outreach and QA communicator, uh, co coordinator and uh, Karthik is a software engineer and he also maintains the infrastructure pieces that are very critical to our projects. So uh, today uh, we are going to talk about some of the testing practices that we follow for our projects and the problems that we are trying to solve while doing that. So uh, we'll begin our presentation with the topics that we have prepared and gradually go into a more interactive session as we start talking about more of the uh, about the specific problems and the strategy that we are trying to use to resolve them. So uh, as we all know, the sum of all human knowledge comes in over 300 languages on the Wikimedia universe. And that is our mission. And we have active projects in nearly 300 languages. And uh, the current set of tools and resources uh, for multilingual content that we support can uh, be used for more than 400 languages. Uh, we don't have projects. Some are there in the incubator, but uh, active is around 300. So for uh, using these languages, we uh, generally use a lot of extra tools and resources all the time. And sometimes we don't even know that we are using them. And uh, uh, but the only thing is that we don't, the, these are not developed so often as we, uh, as we would like them to be. So maybe some part of it is part of a, part of a tool that does uh, general, uh, uh, that does general functions, but it needs a little bit of extra uh, features to make it work for multilingual content. So you already know what these are. They, these are like funds, input methods, uh, spell checkers, uh, tools that help us uh, check grammar, and everything that has to address the special rules of a language to make it work the same way that we generally use English in most systems. 
So uh, the applications and the projects we develop are uh, generally tested in the, in the very same way that any other uh, software project is tested. Uh, like the code sanity, the functionality, and uh, anything that needs to check for the va check and uh, validate that uh, that the functionality and the feature is uh, in tune with what the what the original design for that particular software is supposed to be. I'll let uh, Karthik uh, talk a little bit about the various things that we do. Hi, mm, we know that uh, we write codes, uh, check functionality. We write like automated tested. Chris has uh, had a nice session about it, uh, how the QA writes automated browser test. So uh, for some of our product, we started writing a lot of uh, browser test, but then at some point of time, we realized that even <coughs> writing an automated browser test are not like, it's kind of not enough. We have to uh, do some more testing because the testing with the uh, uh, language require uh, even like visual verification of uh, if if my text is not proper or the font rendering is not proper then I have to test it more in a manual way so uh, like we will go into detail like uh, what are the uh, what are the problems we are facing and uh, which are the methods we we use to tackle them uh, So uh, I'll just take over again. So uh, as Karthik mentioned that uh, the standard test, sorry, uh, as Karthik mentioned, the standard testing processes are often not enough. And uh, that is just one part of the testing, uh, testing, uh, 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 testing uh, process that we have to follow. So uh, the other part is the one that combines the languages the language that we are go going to test with our application and uh, the special rules for that language, the features that are uh, very inherent to the way the language is used in real world, and then test it along with that application. So essentially, the question the question we are trying to answer as a as developers is that my code works. It works as per the features. It works as per what what we planned it to do. But does it look good with the content that we are trying to provide through that application? So at this point, as Karthik mentioned, the, uh, a visual verification becomes extremely important in the process of testing. And, uh, and it, it is important because uh, when we are trying to uh, uh, provide or uh, serve multilingual content through international, uh, through the applications that are supposed to handle them, we need to make sure that uh, the characters, the combinations, the scripts requirements, uh, the funds that are supposed to come through it are working in exactly the same way across devices, across platforms, and as much as we can possibly say. So uh, there, there are some really unusual problems that keep cop cropping up from time to time, and uh, we, we have some of them uh, over here. And by no means, that's, that's not the complete list. We keep running into more problems all the time. So I'll just let uh, Karthik run through, the, uh, run through the problems that we often see. So everybody loves tofu. Even I went to Hong Kong last time. I had a chance to eat first time. And then before that, we had a tofu like this. So tofu is uh, just nothing but when the font is not present in application, it renders like uh, square brackets. So we we like kind of uh, this is the font is here, but it's not rendering in a header uh, because of uh, one bug. So this uh, so that's it's not a good way for a user to to see the, the this kind of reason. Uh, oh yes, and I have this sign in access five font which doesn't work in my language because Google has no Gujarati font by default so either I have to root it or I have to use it like this so every everybody every, everything works fine apart from it I, I cannot see my the content in even in Wikipedia apps so like uh, the many languages like uh, Gujarati uh, Punjabi Burmese and uh, so what we are trying to do we, we, we cannot do much here we have like uh, work from last 
last uh, five years and it's like keep going the co people are adding the comments uh, that's all uh, yeah Wikimedia this app should be fixed in Gujarati and other language uh, I have just filed a bug and uh, that one can be embedded and can be fixed at least for some content we can see the tofu part uh, probably will remain same but at least we can see some content in near future uh, okay so my, even the the we have like kind of fixed the problem uh, with uh, Santos has written a nice algorithm to detect the tofu and uh, it will load the web font we use and it fixed the problem but before that if if we have a user has not selected to choose to download the font uh, it will look like uh, like like this in some point of uh, user interaction to ULS. Uh, may I just interrupt? Yep. Santosh is our team member. He's a senior software developer and I think he's sitting somewhere in the back. Hi Santosh. Oh, there he is. Okay. Yes. So, uh, uh, yeah, so, okay, so another, uh, like, uh, if you have used VE and, uh, hi David, David is here, okay. Uh, so if you have used VE and uh, complex script like Chinese, uh, if you if you like if you if you want to try the the sentence uh, showing on the like first line uh, when you when you press like when you go to the up to two character and try to add the more a uh, character uh, like try to type a more and then you will end it up like uh, sequencing like this in the next sentence so you will not able to type it uh, properly even for a uh, the language like Indic language it has some issue like if you press a backspace it goes back to the the, the first line and then delete the entire sentence or what so this this problem this the problem like this can be very difficult to uh, visualize uh, unless you really taste the code on the like uh, on using the visual verification and uh, I think it's being handled well and the some at some or other point of time but uh, it has to be done like uh, using visual verification and manual testing it's okay so well, i think runa can explain this very well uh, because so, we, uh, we uh, like this is, a, this is a problem that we uh, kind of uh, sorry yeah. very sorry so this is a problem that we kind of uh, identified uh, uh, kind of see very often it's like uh, this is uh, Philippe uh, uh, from the foundation his uh, user page that's being re uh, shown on the Urdu Wikipedia and uh, you can see two brackets one in front of the P and one in front of the W and that's kind of a problem in the way the script is rendered for le right to left languages and uh, it's and it's easy to spot uh, this because most of the uh, Wikipedia, uh, the foundation employees have an official user uh, user user page, which is a user account that comes with brackets. So it's very easy to spot this problem. So uh, the text is by itself written correctly. It's just that the display is completely broken. Okay. Yeah. So uh, okay. Uh, I think the screenshot. Code. Screenshot. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, so can be finished. can become complex scripts. So, yeah. So uh, I'm sorry about that screenshot. For some reason, it didn't come by. It was one of the Indic uh, uh, scripts, the South Asian, one of the South Asian scripts where we have com combined language, uh, combined characters, uh, two or more combined characters, and often uh, we have problems with cursoring. Uh, you never, you're probably trying to repeat. Uh, trying to delete one part of it but when you're trying to uh, use the backspace key or the delete key you are you end up deleting uh, various parts of it without really understanding where it is so uh, these these are things about compl uh, com complex scripts that keep happening all the time so the idea is uh, so the so the takeaway is that at this point of time we really haven't found a way to uh, completely escape from manual testing and uh, the I, and the only thing that we are trying to do is to uh, find ways to make it more organized and make it less painful for everyone because it's kind of a very uh, uh, cumbersome process you have to repeat it often you have to repeat it for a long long time and these are like 
hard to do it uh, and it's manual so there are always chances for uh, gaps to be left out so uh, I'll just run you through a checklist that we are trying to uh, follow this is not the, not like not a like set in stone or anything but just a kind of uh, thing that helps us work through the manual testing process uh, so uh, the first thing is the test that people do during development. These are the standard tests that the developers are doing all the time. They are setting up the unit tests, they're uh, testing the, their code, they're testing functionality and everything else. So that's part of the development plan. Uh, the second part is that once you are through with the standard tests, try to identify the issues and, the, and, the, and check the problems that uh, you know might be occurring for uh, some of the languages or language groups, like similar languages that you are trying to trying to build the application for. So, for, for like if there's a complex script and it uses a, com a combination character, uh, which is really important. If it breaks, it's like you're, it's not going to be very nice. Uh, try to make sure that that uh, combination never never ever breaks. You have to check for it. So it's just for your own sake, like kind of own mental piece and after that is uh, this this list of course is like a must check item list and you don't want to uh, miss doing that then after that uh, if they during the test when you're doing the rest of the test if you find more bugs that are uh, new or they have been recurring even if not in consecutive releases but across multiple release uh, like even across releases with some gaps in between uh, try to make sure that they are again in your must must check item items because they might be recurring due to a completely different thing which is not related to what you're trying to solve so that the, the idea is to make uh, your regression test tests a little bit predictable uh, and also to know for sure that you are covering all your bases in terms of the things that have give, given you some grief in the past but uh, by no means should it actually uh, stop you from hunt the hidden bugs in 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 the in the application because uh, some ad hoc exploration actually helps you identify things that you would otherwise not uh, not go looking for but the only challenge is that uh, sometimes what happens if you're doing the ad hoc exploration is that uh, you may have done a, comp uh, a set of steps and you have found a bug but you don't really know how to retrace back and know what you what exactly you did to go uh, go and get that bug so um, it doesn't matter if it uh, if you cannot find it just then but uh, if whenever you do try to uh, note it down and see that you can repeat it again for a couple of more times so for that, what we are trying to do is we are using a test tracking system. Um, we are using a test link at this point of time. And if there are any more suggestions, uh, uh, if uh, any of you would like to suggest any other testing uh, test tracking systems, test case management systems that we could uh, explore, uh, we'd, be, we'd really appreciate that. Uh, the idea behind using it is to make sure that uh, you know what you are testing. You can repeat them often. You can uh, you can uh, 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 record the successes and the failures and uh, then try and uh, uh, try and uh, build some kind of a report out of them, them if actually necessary if you'd like to see how things are uh, moving but the mo two most important things are the last two things that is the first thing is like talk to the native speakers as much as possible so we are a team of about eight people and our combined language fluency of various degrees is around 20 and uh, but there are as i mentioned about 300 active projects in the in in the wikimedia projects and for the remaining 280 we do have to reach out to everyone in the community as much as possible in the community to try and get some feedback about the about the content because <coughs> sorry because it's not possible physically not possible for us to understand that and even though we are native speakers of some of the languages it's often important for us to go and verify things with some some experts of the language who would probably be helping us with things like classical scripts or uh, uh, or characters that have not been in use for a long time but they might be required for addressing uh, for uh, for wiki source or something for ancient manuscripts 
So that's an important thing. And the other is uh, maintaining testing environments where users can come and they can test the applications independently without really having to always being uh, guided through the process. So they can come and test and uh, then give you some kind of a feedback in, uh, in a suitable form. <coughs> So, yeah, like, uh, uh, for a content translation project, do we have quite nice, uh, uh, like, setup in beta labs? So, user can come and test. So, we got like a, a good feedback uh, for Catalan community about it. So, I think it's a good idea to put a, some public uh, test environment so user can test in very well manner. Yeah, that. Sorry. That is actually important because the content translation project that uh, some of you may have uh, heard about or have even seen is uh, extremely important in terms of uh, checking, making sure that the content we are trying to pass through that tool is uh, usable when we are creating wiki pages, new wiki pages from them. So uh, that's kind of everything that we had to say, and <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's. Anyways, we we couldn't find anything better to uh, represent. Oh, and I had to mention we haven't tested on Google Glass yet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we also have some other team members around the crowd, so if there are other questions, like if we cannot address them, we'll guide you to them. No? Okay. Anyone? I didn't know the, 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 the blocks were called spams. That's yeah. nice. Good thing They're to called know. tofus or... Uh, tofu, sorry, yeah. Yeah, and tofu. some... What did you use? I think I just called it spam, but I meant to say tofu. Ah, okay. I didn't know that was called tofu. <laughs> okay, I think in some, some, uh, some people also call them chiclets, like the chewing gum. Okay, folks. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Daniel Schwen, and he's going to talk about fast CCI, um, taming the commons category tree. Can I just make an announcement? Yes. Sorry. Can I use this? Uh, yeah. Use this one to read it. All right. Uh, sorry about that. So we have some booklets over here. Uh, you can just pick them up. It's kind of uh, we made them as an introduction to the team kind of booklet and the kind of work we do and who we are and uh, how you can help us with uh, multilingual uh, applications. Please feel, feel free to take them. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'll be, uh, talking, I'll be talking about the uh, commons category system or its structure, some of its uh, good properties uh, or interesting properties and uh, some of the annoying properties. And I'll be uh, presenting a tool that uh, would, should, helpfully, uh, should hopefully help to tame the uh, category tree. So uh, just to refresh your memory, Commons cat categories are a hierarchical system for the classification of images that are uploaded to Commons. Uh, first question, is it really a tree? Uh, so on the first slide, I'll just work with a made up example. There's this uh, category tree of animals, animals with fur, animals with beaks, an animal with a beak could be a duck, animal with fur could be a beaver, animal with fur could also be a platypus, and you probably see where this is going. So. Uh, uh, um, yeah, we, we get diamond relations because uh, a platypus is also an animal uh, with a beak. So at this point, it already is uh, not really a tree anymore. But uh, it gets worse. Let's look at the diet of the platypus. I'm not a zoologist, so a little disclaimer. Um, assuming a platypus eats plants and maybe other animals, so there should be subcategories on the, the platypus diet, uh, like. Uh, plants and animals. Unfortunately, animals is already a super category of the uh, platypus. And uh, so uh, we may have loops in this thing. So we call this a directed graph and not a tree. Uh, and in computer science or whatever, usually the arrow direction goes in the other direction. And the relation uh, is a well-defined directional relation in this 
directed graph and that is being a subcategory of. So the actual meaning of uh, what being a subcategory of another category means uh, is somewhat loosely defined on commons. There are actually many things that being a subcategory can mean. Can mean being can mean being a, a sort of kind of thing or a part of something. Um, special attributes like green animals, blue animals, uh, location like animals in Africa, whatever, right? Timing, uh, animals in 2004, that's subcategories we, we could have. Agentive and influence relations, uh, animals created by God. Uh, <laughs> modification, uh, dead animals, we do have that category. So these are all possible relations uh, we can have. Uh, and it says in the commons category policy that we should uh, avoid cyclic structures. So let's go back to the loops. A little analysis of the category graph shows that we have a crap ton uh, of loops. So uh, loops with a size of one are categories which are subcategories of itself. So this is most likely a bug in pretty much every case, yeah, if you know. <laughs> A case where it makes sense that a category is also a category of itself. Let me know after the talk. Uh, and then there are cases where a category is uh, has a subcategory that is also a parent category. Yeah. So uh, that, those are loops that contain two categories. That is probably uh, and there are thousands, uh, two thousand approximately, or one thousand. Well. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, so there are about 1,000 cases, and those are probably all uh, editing mistakes where somebody wanted to uh, insert a subcategory but didn't know that in wiki text it actually means uh, inserting a parent category. And then there are loops uh, of various sizes, goes up to pretty large loops. Uh, okay, but let's, uh, let's look at what, uh, what makes us happy about categories. Categories bundle similar images. So when you find an image on commons uh, and click on one of the categories, you immediately get a selection of images that uh, uh, have something in common with this uh, category. So Mr. Softy Trucks in Hong Kong. What makes us angry about categories is that they hide content. If you look at category Paris, for example, you find a whooping five, or I think yesterday was seven images, and everything else uh, which is related to Paris is uh, diffused down into subcategories of, of Paris. So it makes it kind of hard to discover images if you don't exactly know what you're looking for. What makes us happy is that uh, categories can encode complex relations more than just a simple and yeah, we can have uh, like spatial relations, star symbols on top of objects, people inside flowers. That exists, only one image. Uh, that is distinctly different from people holding flowers or people next to flowers or with flowers. Then we have uh, like excluding uh, relationships like Nandi sculptures outside India. So it would be kind of hard to uh, uh, have a like a tag uh, and, and a regular and relation with that. And, and incidentally, this is uh, six levels below category India, so which shows you what the relationships between categories are. It's sometimes confusing. Sundials without sun uh, is actually five levels below category sun. Okay. Uh, what makes us angry is that categories often do encode really complex relations like this one. Category demographic maps of uh, 15 to 70 year old dependent children whose fathers speak another uh, language and did not state proficiency in English and whose mothers <laughs> speak another language and speak English not well or not at all in Australia by state and uh, or territory. Uh, and yeah, we should. <laughs> so this is... This is, uh, yeah, that's the longest uh, category I could find via a short SQL uh, query. And that thing uh, has subcategories, right? <laughs> For like, uh, <laughs> okay. So um, what kind of makes me angry is that some categories are like natural intersections. And so we can look at uh, Art of Japan, those are actual uh, categories. It has two subcategories, metal work in Japan and sculptures 
in Japan. And those two categories have a common subcategory, metal sculptures in Japan. So one might think uh, it would be maybe not a bad idea to express relations like that using uh, intersections which can be uh, computed uh, dynamically. And we have uh, a lot of these uh, diamond relations, millions. So what about uh, using tags? Tags, uh, yeah, tags are a system of uh, classifying objects that does not have a hierarchy. There are no sub-tags or anything. You just um, assign topics and you assume that all the topics apply to an image. That's the end relation that I referred to uh, earlier. So uh, those are popular in uh, photo communities such as Flickr or 500 pixel. And we may get tags, I've, I've heard that here through Wikidata. However, don't hold your breath, my guess. Uh, and then there's gonna be community consensus. Uh, I'm sure there are uh, people who really love commons categories and uh, there's a lot of manual uh, curation that's, that's being put in there and I don't wanna uh, uh, crap all over that, certainly. So uh, if we have both systems, it will probably be an additional maintenance burden. So, and we really we can't replace all applications of, uh, of categories as I try to show with uh, more complex relations. And it won't solve today's problems. So what we can do as a stopgap measure is just treat categories as if they were tags, which uh, certainly works for high level categories like the one word categories, kitten, Wyoming, bicycle, screen. And consider all images in and below uh, all the subcategories of, uh, of a given category uh, uh, as if the, this, the top category tag uh, applies to them. And yeah, uh, and an intersection would be uh, all images uh, which both labels apply to. Yeah, there's a slight problem with that uh, since we have this hierarchical, hierarchical system. Uh, the high up categories actually kind of lose meaning the further down in the graph we go, the further, the more steps we take. So, uh, as an example, uh, here's the longest category chain that I uh, could find on Commons. It's uh, about uh, 320 steps long. There's a couple of maintenance categories in there. And there's a lot of uh, topic jumps. It's kind of kind of interesting. So there's like martial arts here. A few steps later, you're at vector mathematics. Uh, it's electromagnetic radiation and humanitarian aid. Uh, this is humans, uh, geography of Denmark. Uh, it jumps Statue of Liberty, uh, the François Mitterrand. Uh, and somehow we get to Wikipedia and end up uh, at uh, an airport in uh, Poland. Okay. Yeah, so uh, obviously uh, high up categories don't really apply to <laughs> images in the categories further down. So uh, there's uh, the solution to that is adding uh, like a metric to weigh uh, the intersection results. And a good metric, uh, given that example, what could for example, be the path lengths in the graph. So how far down do you have to go to find a particular image uh, in the, uh, the subcategory graph? So yeah, then we can uh, look at what the, uh, what the average depth in our uh, category graph are. So for, for every uh, depth in, uh, in, the, in the category graph, uh, so uh, that means how many levels below do you have at, at most, we can count the number of categories. And so a lot of categories uh, are yeah, terminal categories, right? So the end where, where no more subcategories can be found. And then we have like a, uh, approximately a exponential decay. Uh, and uh, I'd say at level 30 or so, uh, what comes is uh, a freak show, uh, freak cases, yeah? So uh, let's not worry about that. So the problem is that you really have to go down quite a few levels. And if you go down quite a few levels, if you do category intersection the old way uh, by recursively uh, performing SQL queries against the database, uh, you still have to uh, uh, query, uh, yeah, thousands of uh, subcategories, right? And that takes uh, an insanely long time. So uh, the idea for this uh, 
fast CCI tool was the need for uh, fast category intersection. And uh, another important point is it's kind of important to have an easy interface, yeah, so that people can actually use your tool. Uh, I want a really shallow learning curve, uh, but powerful options should be available. And the killer application for category intersection, uh, in, in my opinion, is um, uh, the feature picture, quality image, and uh, valued image uh, system. Does anybody know what these badges mean? Anybody heard of them? Yeah, okay, those are assessment uh, projects on commons where uh, the pictures that were uploaded can be nominated and then people uh, will tear them apart or, <laughs> uh, or say that they're great, right? So some of them look for uh, like overall awesomeness, uh, some look more for like technical, uh, yeah, solid technical qualities and uh, the valued image uh, picture looks for images that are hard to obtain and uh, uh, yeah, uh, that we may only have a few of. So these uh, projects all created parallel category tree. So every image that, uh, for example, gets a featured picture star uh, is in category featured picture. But it also uh, is very likely to be in category featured pictures of something. Featured pictures of uh, bicycles. I don't know. So there are uh, 640 of these uh, categories and they create an additional maintenance burden, right? So we already have the, uh, the picture in, in the featured picture category and already has a topic category. So why should we mix that? So yeah, to me that's an ideal target for intersection. And uh, you can create an easy interface one button, which basically, yeah, shown on a, on a category page, uh, will show all the images in the category and below the category that have uh, either one of these badges uh, attached to it. So if we click the button, uh, we will get an automatic uh, selection, yeah, automatically generated uh, list. Just takes like two seconds uh, or three at most. And uh, the, the gadget or let's say the server behind it digs through all the categories, looks through millions of images uh, and spits out the one that have like the nice little star thingy or the quality image badge. Uh, sometimes you get results that kind of surprise you. So I don't know, my, my previous uh, uh, category example was category Idaho. And if you scroll down a bit in the search results, you get this uh, Glacier Point at Sunset in Yosemite National Park, California, USA. So it's kind of surprising that uh, this should show up in the results. One wouldn't think that it has anything to do with Idaho, which is, uh, yeah, well, the potato state. Yeah. Uh, so the, the tool also generates this breadcrumb trail and shows you exactly why the particular picture was included in the search results so that you can actually blame the people who are responsible for the categorization rather than me. So in this case, uh, geography of Idaho, Great Basin. Uh, unfortunately, the Great Basin now, yeah, Great Basin is not included in Idaho. Yeah, so it's uh, like a semantic problem in in my opinion. Uh, but the uh, half dome is uh, is part of the Great Basin, more more or less. Okay, and then we have an advanced interface. Uh, so with all the server backend stuff, uh, once that's implemented, it's fairly easy to uh, uh, support general or generic category intersections and category, category exclusions, uh, such as uh, querying images uh, that are in category kitten, but not in uh, category dead animals. And we can do plenty of statistical analysis of categories finding loops, so that might be interesting for debugging purposes of debugging the category tree uh, and yeah, do science-y nonsense. Uh, the advanced interface is available through this uh, little drop-down menu and here you can uh, select to uh, only display featured quality or valued images rather than them lumped together and here you can perform the uh, intersection and exclusion search. So here, category Wyoming, uh, you can uh, click on and in or uh, uh, and type in another category name, uh, uses the auto completion API. <coughs> 
So in this case, bison, and boom, you get a list of, uh, or a gallery of bison pictures that are taken in Wyoming, hopefully. Uh, yeah, actually, like an hour ago, I uh, fixed the gadget to uh, actually uh, say that in the title once you perform the search. So what's this uh, slider here, strong match, weak match? Uh, that refers uh, to the metric, yeah, the path lengths. So again, let's look at uh, uh, featured pictures of, uh, of Idaho. Uh, here we have the Snake River. I know for a fact that's in Wyoming. And I know that this flower uh, was taken in uh, Illinois. Yeah, I took that picture. So why is it here? That's probably because that uh, flower can also be found, or that species uh, can also be found in, in Idaho. But uh, maybe we want something more specific. So we can use this uh, slider here uh, to modify. So something disappeared, right? Move the slider to the left, uh, make the match stronger. So ma making the match stronger means uh, we exclude search results that require the algorithm to search too far into the category graph. We slide it further over, slide it even further over. Uh, if we have a very strong match, then uh, we can be fairly confident that the images are really uh, strongly connected to uh, the current category we are in. So a um, little bit about the technical stuff. Uh, the, uh, the server backend works exclusively with page IDs. Page IDs are nice. They're just integer numbers, integer numbers that are unique across namespaces. So every file, every category, every talk page, user page, article, gallery page, whatever, uh, has a unique number. Yeah, and there are no common numbers between namespaces. So we, uh, we can just pull a list of, uh, of all the categories and files, and we search in the database for, uh, for the subcategory and file is in category relations, and just use the numbers we get. And we can store that. We have, uh, yeah, we have about 30 million files. We have about uh, 3.5 million categories. So we need about 34 million page IDs. That's 130 megabytes. It's not very much. We have uh, 10 million subcategory relations, so one category is a subcategory of another, and we have 125 million file is in category da -da -da, uh, relations. And that's uh, substantially more than we have uh, files because many files are in multiple categories. Uh, and that in uh, squashed together into a bunch of integers, uh, 550 uh, megabytes, fits into RAM easily. Uh, RAM is fast, right? We don't need any database uh, uh, nonsense. Yeah, and uh, we'll just use the API to look up the actual names of the categories and the actual names of the pictures uh, on the client <laughs> side in, in the JavaScript gadget. So the server itself just juggles around with uh, numbers and just gives a string or a bunch of numbers back. So this uh, FastCCI gadget uh, uses two labs instances. So it might be a little uh, excessive, but uh, nonetheless. So there's a master instance, which is used to uh, re rebuild and refresh the uh, FastCCI database, that huge block of numbers. And there's a worker instance, uh, which actually uh, performs or takes the queries and performs the work. So, yeah, the database format, again, uh, yeah, we have two files. One contains, it's called tree, I know it's a lie, sorry. Uh, so it should be FastCCI graph, which contains all the relations between categories. And then we have another uh, table, which is the index into the tree. If I have a specific category, where can I find all the data about the category relations and, uh, uh, and the file relations in that big tree? Uh, so how does uh, performing a query on the category graph work? Um, we're essentially generating subgraphs. Uh, I'm walking the graph uh, breadth first, so that means uh, I check every level of subcategories fully and then go to the next level of subcategories. So that way I get the more relevant results first, right? I get the results that are closer to uh, the top category. And I have to maintain a visitation map. Essentially, that means I color every category that my algorithm visits. I wouldn't have to do that if it <laughs> was a tree, but unfortunately, it is a, a cyclic directed graph. I have stupid loops. So I could 
if I wouldn't do that, I could just be trapped in loops, which would be terrible. And yeah, and I'm, uh, I kind of remember where I found each category, how deep it was, so that I can assign the metric when I return the result to the client. And I uh, intersect by uh, iterating over one of the result list and output everything that is tagged as visited in the uh, second result list. And um, uh, the exclusion uh, just works the opposite way. Well, the same way, except that I output everything that is not visited in list two. Uh, yeah, and then there's this special case uh, for uh, for showing the good pictures, and for that I pre-generate a union subgraph uh, which contains all the feature pictures, quality images, and uh, BIs, and have a static visitation map uh, for that. And I store a bit mask uh, for the awards. So essentially, I store for every image in the Commons database whether it is uh, featured quality image or VI. So uh, that means that for each of these um, uh, common queries, yeah, when the user click, just clicks on the button, I only have to uh, search the subgraph of the current uh, category and all the other information is already prepared. So that makes it uh, super duper fast. So since this is a technology track, uh, this is how the whole thing works internally. It is a uh, C program, uses uh, libonion, which uh, uh, is kind of yeah, kind of neat. Uh, uses uh, that's that does the HTTP server stuff. So there's a an HTTP server thread, there's a worker thread, there's a notification thread, and here we have the client who is just some guy who clicks on a button uh, on the comments web page. So the client sends a request via HTTP, possibly a WebSocket connection. The HTTP server thread uh, takes the request and pushes it onto a queue. The worker thread looks at the queue and fetches the next work item. Uh, the worker thread is also updating uh, the, uh, work item, uh, the work item status. And then we have a notification thread that looks at the status and periodically sends out uh, the status of the current work item to the client. Yeah, to the client. So when the work is actually performed uh, during the uh, during the querying, uh, again the status is updated. Uh, so I'll, I'll mention in a bit more detail what that means uh, in a minute. And once the work is uh, completed, a result is generated and streamed to the client. So the whole thingy, uh, server-side uh, stuff, can be found on GitHub. Uh, yeah, I mentioned WebSockets. WebSockets are kind of cool because they allow me to give immediate feedback uh, to the user. For example, if the client uh, is sending a request, but uh, like 100 other people uh, have decided to send queries at the same time, uh, the queue might be full, so the client will get messages uh, that a certain number of people are ahead of him in line, and he'll actually see a countdown uh, until uh, all the other work items are uh, done, and then it's on his query or her query uh, is, uh, is executed. And while the work item is running, uh, the user will get an update about through how many images this uh, the server is actually uh, searching through. So for many smaller categories, uh, uh, this uh, the work is done so fast uh, the client never sees an update. For but for some categories, like uh, if you go to Category London, click on Feature Pictures, you'll see uh, fast CCI client is digging through one million, two million, three million images. Okay, yeah, and uh, shouts out to. Uh, to this guy for providing the HTTP server library. I actually submitted a pull request to him and fixed the bug, so now uh, WebSocket connections are working properly, which was uh, very crucial for me. So how is the data uh, shipped to the client? There are several transfer protocols or methods that uh, can be used, like a simple thing is the uh, XML HTTP request. Uh, which is basically a piece of JavaScript in the browser requesting a web page, right? Uh, and he gets, uh, or the client gets uh, a, a piece of plain text which can be passed. Every line is, is an item, like there's uh, a little token. Uh, so this is a result set. 
there's another piece of the result set uh, as uh, a bit of meta information. So but that's not the cool part. Oh yeah, and for, for really old browsers where cross-domain requests don't work, right? Since the FastCCI server sits on a labs instance and the, uh, the client script is running uh, in the browser from the commons.wikimedia.org page. Uh, in old browsers, that uh, it's not permitted to connect difference to connect to servers other than the uh, the origin of the uh, script. Uh, the uh, JavaScript callback can be used. That means that when a uh, when a request is issued, a script is loaded, and that script is uh, dynamically generated and just calls a callback uh, with the results uh, list as an array. But the really cool uh, transport method is WebSockets, as supported in most modern browsers. Uh, with that, you can open a standing connection and have uh, have the ability to stream data back from the client, and that's how you get like the continuous updates. And there's quite a bit more information that goes through WebSockets than compared to the uh, uh, these old school methods. So uh, immediately, ah, what I haven't shown is the, the waiting message. I'll get to that. Uh, once the compute starts, uh, the client is notified, uh, and then there are several updates uh, about the uh, oops about the current uh, compute task. Then the results are streamed, and then the meta information. So waiting uh, packets tell the client uh, if they, if he, she, or uh, uh, whatever has to has to wait until uh, the the server has time to process her request. Uh, working uh, streams the current result set sizes, which is an indication through how much data the client uh, the, the server is digging. Then in the results we have the page ID, the depth, which is the metric for for the importance of the search result, uh, and the featured picture quality images and valued images uh, flags. Out of is oops, out of is the uh, total estimated result size. It's estimated because uh, the client doesn't generate more results than necessary. So if I uh, flat list a huge category, the results could be, yeah, if I flat list uh, commons roots, I would get 30 million results. Those are not generated. Uh, it's just uh, the first 200 are generated. And if a continuation request uh, is made, like the user clicks on the more button, then, then more results are generated. Uh, DBH is uh, information just for the user how fresh uh, the database currently is. Yeah, that's uh, that's it from me. So I'd be happy to answer further questions. Any questions? Must be one question. Not one? No. Perhaps a silly question. Do you have people who are now willing to fix some of the category problems that you've found? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, sure. There's a, a big, quite a big community of people who are really into dabbling with uh, categories on comments. So, and I've uh, publicized the loop issue uh, on the village pump, and there was a call to action, and then there was a bit more discussion. Hi, uh, maybe some of these loops are intentional, and uh, yeah, tangling of content makes it more discoverable. Uh, so it's not, uh, not always uh, a clear cut thing. So I, I mentioned that the loops of size one and two are most likely nonsense, and those should be should be fixed. Yeah. So I'll, I do think that some Sorry, okay. So perhaps some of the categories which some of the commons users have been done is for spamming, I think. Uh, have you encountered that one? Yeah, that's that's a very uh, social question that doesn't belong in a technology track. Uh. <laughs> Yes, that's so maybe some people want to increase exposure for their images. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, uh, that's that's for the community to decide, and that's really something uh, where a, a gadget cannot really help. And it's hard for me to analyze which category is a spam category and 
which not? I mean, what's the what's the criterion that you apply? And Martin was next. Uh, I wonder. Uh, I've, I've looked at categories in the past, so like this, uh, the cycles, etc. I run, uh, run into them too. Uh, I operate a bot in Commons. It's called Categorization Bot, and it automatically categorizes pictures. Oh, and it really doesn't like cycles and other broken structures because it will just make a mess of it. Yeah. Uh, did you also look into uh, like uh, broken links? For example, you have an intersection churches in London, and it's not in the tree of London or not in the tree of churches, because we have loads of those too, and that's uh, yeah, that, that's a very, very good point. Uh, and with this tool, it should be rather simple to build an interface to do just that. I mean, it'll still uh, require manual intervention, right? If you go to churches in London, somebody has to say this should be in London and this should be in churches, mm. right? But yeah, that certainly can be done. With, with a bit of statistics and smart querying, you find loads of it. I think I've yeah. still have some old lists of that. And another thing, uh, you know, Wikidata query from Magnus Manske. Uh, have you lo looked into integrating with that? Because uh, it already connects a lot of uh, a lot of Wikidata items already connect to commons categories and we have a lot of information and yeah i i haven't yet i i must admit i have uh not given wikidata as much attention as it uh, deserves yeah because <laughs> then you could do the multilingual things and other exactly uh, yeah stuff. That'd, be, that'd be great yeah. any more questions yeah there's one further down Okay, my question is, will FAST CCI consider different languages? You know that there are a lot of categorization written in different languages. So current Commons policy is uh, that categories should be in English and there should only be one category tree. There should only be one category applying to a particular subject. Yeah. Uh, it's in, in Commons uh, colon categories, it's one of the rules. Um, the multi-language issue, I believe, is going to be tackled by Wikidata, right? Uh, so, right now my tool doesn't know anything about language. It, uh, as I said, the server <laughs> works with numbers. It only knows about the category relations, if a category is a subcategory of a category. So, if somebody inserts a category written in Arabic or uh, Persian or whatever into the category tree, it just looks like a, another number to it. So, uh, of course, that would be found, yeah, even though it may not be according to policy. Any more questions? How many people are using the gadget? Today? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I I think I get one request every 20 seconds. So yeah, uh, it's yeah. I I worried so much about this thing being fast, uh, and but there's lots of headroom. I think people can could query it like a hundred times more, so and the server wouldn't break down. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, um, thanks, Daniel, for fast CCI.
Do you have any? No, I didn't make a mistake. Okay, that's from your model. You can make a double link to it. Yeah. So maybe I shouldn't be using film. Yeah. Stuck too quickly. Like, I guess, man, I was just done. Right now, I only have to make a list of media stuff. It's a graph, so if you go up, it doesn't explode that much. Yeah, that's true, yeah. I mean, Three three yeah, three issues. Three issues. Three issues. So, so yeah, I was looking at some other things we did. I didn't want to get. I'm going to make a list of broken. I'm not sure if I want to like. And you could do a lot of matching and stuff. I haven't been using this. I'm going to have a page. Okay. 